Hey there, welcome to the Ryan Kingsline Show. My name's Ryan Kingsline, and in this podcast, we interview amazing artists, creatives, and creators to find out how they tick and how they got where they are today. So sit back, relax. I look forward to sharing their journey with you. All right. Welcome, guys. Welcome to another interview here. Here today, I have with me Javier Perez. And so some of you guys are here live with me and some of you are tuning into this at a later point in time. And so those of you who are here live, remember one of the most significant factors in helping you get that job and connecting and get yourself out there is using the force multipliers, not the Jedi force, but like software. So that's really the conversation that we are having today. Because when I saw Javier's work, specifically in some of the ways in which he's pushing it into geometry and doing some just really amazing work in that. I was just like, I've got to meet Javier. So Javier, man, thanks for being here. Of course. Pleasure to be here. So the key thing, and I think it was actually this beehive scene Mm -hmm. that's on your art station that I was looking at and I was like, oh my God, Holy Mary, Mother of God, this is just... Because there's no real sculpting. It's like all... It's 100% substance. Yeah, it's all 100% in substance, correct. Yeah, so I want to get into this scene and I want to unpack this and be like, how the heck did you do honeybee as in substance? But first, I want to get into your background a little bit like, and what oh, you do. Yeah. So like, what do you do now? What's your day job, so to speak? So currently, I'm a uh, senior environment texture artist at Intrepid Studios. We're a small little like indie studio in mm-hmm. San Diego, California, and we're working on a new uh, MMO called Ashes of Creation. Actually, at the end of this month, we're releasing our first product, which is kind of a sub thing from the MMO. We're doing a battle royale. So all the stuff you um, do with the battle royale, like you can gain all these kinds of um, cosmetics and stuff that will go into the MMO once that it comes out. And that uh, the release date of that is like still pending. (laughs) Okay. What is this? You said senior texture environment artist. Is that what I heard? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, well, unpack that for me because it's when we look at environment arts, you know, because I'm on the education side, so I'm always trying to explain to people what this is. There's a lot of different yes. ways. Yeah. And so tell me a little bit about this. Okay. Well, when I first joined Intrepid, I actually just started with the title, just senior environment artist. Mm-hmm. And as I was working, like in my, you know, just my regular uh, environment art role, um, yeah. I started gravitating more to doing just materials and texture works. I was finding myself making materials and textures for the other people on the team, which that they were using um, on their models. And so like at about a year in, my CEO or my boss noticed that like I was gravitating towards that. And he said, do you just want to go full on uh, texture artist? And I said, yeah, that's that sounds great. And then when that happened, around the same time, mm-hmm. I actually got pulled onto the character team because the character team started needing some materials as well. Right, And then from there, I kind of just, I, I was kind of bouncing back and forth between the environment and character team, helping them with materials. And I kind of just stuck with materials. But here and there, I, I'll still get some environment tasks that includes like modeling and creating LODs and stuff like that. So, And I'm assuming this is just because a substance came around and it's just substance designer and painter. It's just so yeah. awesome that yeah, it's yeah. like a whole right. new job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I actually joined Intrepid back in 20... 20- I think it's 2017. We actually did not have any substance like uh, designer pipeline. None of the uh, artists were using designer. So I kind of brought that into the studio. I kind of showed it off and showed the possibilities. And then people were able to see that once I was like cranking out these textures a lot quicker and materials a lot quicker Mm -hmm. and just the possibilities of the different variations of the trims I could get going. Um, It's all the true potential. And now everyone at the studio um, knows designer and uses it on a daily basis. Okay, good. So that's actually a really good point to bring up where we can talk about trims, because I imagine that was probably one of the really powerful ways. And in fact, I don't think I've talked enough about substance with trims, because I've only talked about, for the most part, substance in terms of just like a wall or a ground. Yeah, I do actually have, let me see. Yeah. So these these kinds of, um, this whole like kind of uh, modular, like, um, dungeon that we did in the game this was actually like this whole kind of thing was actually just textured with one trim texture Mm -hmm. and if like if i scroll down a little bit you'll be able to even this one you can kind of see the same kind of treatment and the same walls and stuff like that but here's a perfect example so 
you can tell from like this kind of trim texture that all these modular pieces were textured with just that single. Um, it was like one single twenty forty eight. So and we, where did uh, you get this twenty? What uh, sorry, one single twenty forty eight? Let's start there. What was the question? Sorry. What do you mean? You said everything is textured with one single twenty forty eight. Oh. Yeah. So the way the UVs are laid out, mm -hmm. it's um, you. We're actually grabbing these like smaller kind of strips. Yes. The way we're you being like this piece right here, uh -huh. even though it's curved, you're able to lay it out flat completely on the, the UV space, the UV shell. Right. And you're essentially stretching it over the 2D uh, texture. So that's why you're able to like kind of, it's almost just like stacking it where you want it to go. And yeah. And then uh, I, though it does add more like texture breaks in there. The problem with just games in general right now is um, I think it's we're more lenient nowadays with geometry, whereas material count is definitely the thing that is hindering our ability to like produce some like gorgeous environments. Like right. uh, our programmers are always like, you know, we got to keep our material counts down. But as far as geometry, I've been I've been very fortunate to pretty much go nuts at work with like as far as geometry. It's not as important as it is like saving on texture count and materials just because of in game, the rendering, it's all happening on screen and stuff. Whereas with geometry, you can actually LOD a lot of the stuff as the player is like really far from it. Mm. So you can yeah. cut it out so it's not being calculated. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Fantastic. All right. So the big question here for a lot of people, and I see this with certain workflows with Substance Designer, is um, Substance Designers doesn't create geometry. So they say. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so in a lot of workflows, they will start with something sculpted in ZBrush, for example, like a yeah. simple shape. And is that your workflow as well? No, that that's what gets me to push myself to not do that in Substance Designer is I want to see how far I can push what like without being outside of the program. And recently, with all the new um, additions that Substance has been coming out with, with the new like shape extrude node and being able to just plug in a flat two D image, plug it into this node, and it renders it in three-dimensional space. I think it's been helping a lot of people um, kind of stay in the program. Yeah. Um, there's still some issues with clipping, which I'm still trying to solve. But for the most part, I've been um, getting some pretty good results as of late. My most recent projects can definitely show that off, especially with the uh, axe and then the bees as well. <laughs> yeah, because that takes us right to the bee. It's like, yeah, <laughs> you know, how? because I swear that was as soon as I saw it, I can't remember who sent it to me, but it was like, that's not possible, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean... Wait, is that, the, is that the B right there? Is that the nodal network for the B? Yes, correct. Oh, yes. my gosh. So, yeah, if you guys are... If you're listening to this and you're not tuning in, the guys that are here live are able to see this with me, but that's like yeah. a beautiful... Um, I, did, I did... I think I might have talked to um, one of your students, but I did mention that I would be going over it live on Twitch on over this weekend just because Sweet. I'm cleaning it up. I'm going to be cleaning it up for a presentation I have at a, a university. Yeah. So I'll be actually opening the graph because this is a graph currently, but I'm just going to be cleaning it up and labeling it a little better. But yeah. And then all the nodes, like kind of the node setup is actually available on ArtStation. And like I try to make it as high res as possible so you can actually go in and kind of um, zoom in and see what exactly are the internals of it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So we can see that over there on ArtStation. And um, maybe we can talk you into a into a presentation later on this. Yeah. We'll do a little high level today. So this is all a nodal network. So walk me through some of the just the thinking, the high level thinking, because usually when we talk about substance designer, we're talking about noise. So it's some kind of pattern, like tree bark. I'll start with like I think a uh, grunge and map 005, I think if I remember right. And so surfacing has everything to do with taking noise and then controlling that noise pattern. This is different, right. though. Yeah, so with this, more so, you're kind of throwing away all that, kind of what you were saying about just basically layering a bunch of noises and surfaces, whereas this one, you're when you do something like this, you're primarily thinking of the shapes. And you can see, like, right from the get-go, I'm starting off with these basic, just, like, circular shapes with the shape node, and I'm just kind of... I'm kind of transforming them and using the new quad transform that Substance just came out with. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, I'm basically just shifting them and moving them, sizing them. And I'm basically subtracting a bunch of stuff or adding a bunch of different shapes with all the different blend nodes. The surfacing comes 
later on that those principles still apply, but it's more so towards the end when you're getting down into the nitty gritty of like the actual surface of the, um, the bee. Mm-hmm. But when, when you start off, like, I think the most important thing is you want to get the shape of the actual bee down before anything else. Like you don't want to start adding all these like super, like the the hairs on it or like just the really like minuscule details. You really want to get, make sure the shapes read well and like that, the, the actual forms, like, you know, it looks like a bee. It feels like a bee. So, I mean, you can just see, like, I continue, like, through the graph. It's just a bunch of blends of adding and subtracting. It's a bunch of uh, different masks that are adding a bunch of little um, small objects and stuff. From here, this was all kind of the basic shape. And here, I'm adding the hair. And then up here, this was the actual legs as well. And again, it's more just of the same. I, you, you'll constantly, in my graphs, you'll constantly see me using the shapes a lot and just kind of transforming them and bending them to my will. And yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a lot of work, but, but, yeah, but it's pretty amazing. So the, yeah. so an entire B created by using this, the new shape kind yeah. of it, t- tool set. We'll it, just call it tool set. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I would say 90% of what I used to actually create the B was already in substance. Mm-hmm. There was a few new nodes that I actually, I found on one of them I found on Gumroad that was extremely helpful and that was to create the actual legs that you can these kinds of uh these kinds of legs that you see right here because mm-hmm. they're so curvy getting that curve shape is always I found the most difficult part inside of substance to get like to get your just your shapes to follow a certain kind of line almost yeah but there's this node um See if I can find it. Is that I actually used it as well in my axe, but it's the same way that I used to make these kinds of uh, swirly nodes in um, or swirly shapes inside the axe. Oh, that's a that's a great one for us to segue to because you know the honeybee yeah. not necessarily going to apply that every day, but in yeah, ornamentation, yeah. this is one of the biggest issues we have. You know, do we go yeah, into yeah. Z brush and then you have to deal with the polygon counts and UV? Exactly. And, you know, it's, you're, um, it starts to change the conversation. Yeah. So, yeah, I linked it in actually my art station, but it's a it's a, a substance designer curve node, mm-hmm. and it basically it, it works as exactly how it says. It's like you're essentially drawing bezier handles inside a substance designer, but you're plugging in a shape, so it's kind of just following the curves that you draw. Got and it. you can put in a bunch of different plug in some gradients to give like this nice fall off at the very end, so it's not like completely. Um, solid or it gives like this nice taper yeah um again once you have like your main shape it's just more of the same it's your kind of transforming it and you're blending on top of each other to get like a full kind of shape and form whereas for this essentially think like for this i basically plugged in the sphere Mm -hmm. and because and with the actual the substance this nose it's actually being um like duplicated on this path like probably two thousand times yeah, that's why you're getting kind of this solid, um, kind of solid shape. Whereas in the B, I basically plugged in a little segment of the B leg and maybe like said like, okay, I want to duplicate this five times along this kind of curve that I already drew. Yeah. So it's easier to control and manage in that aspect. And that is just absolutely amazing. I this program every time I <laughs> something yeah. new, it's a. Uh, yeah, every time it always reminds me of the excitement of ZBrush back in the day because it's like this yeah, is yeah. changing the game so much. Yeah. So tell me, how does this affect people getting into environment arts today? Because I've got students, we focus on props and we focus on environments, we focus on substance, of course. But how does this affect when you're hiring or you're thinking about hiring or looking at artists that you may want to join the team? What is it that yeah. they should be thinking about or doing with substance? Whenever we get resumes in or whenever we like are thinking about hiring an environment artist, yeah. my number one question is always, do they know designer? Because right now, like if they don't know designer, 99% of the time, we probably won't hire them. Just because it's embedded in our tools pipeline, all we're able to share a bunch of different materials. We're able to share if one of the artists creates a small little graph and we're able to share that with the rest of the team so we don't have to constantly keep creating that same graph over and over again. It just keeps all the artists cohesive, essentially. So they got to so, have substance. And then how, how do they prove that, right? Because there's got to be a threshold. I mean, so you can throw some yeah. 
nodes together I, and grab some things off the marketplace and you're like, hey, I got a substance designer material. It definitely comes down to the art test. At Intrepid, we give a bunch of art tests. So when I first did my art test, all my uh, materials were made inside a substance designer. Mm -hmm. And I sent over the graphs and stuff like that so they could really check it out. But yeah, definitely having a portfolio, being versatile as far as like showing all your game environments, but also showing like your just your material renders, your spheres, just that we can see that you understand just surfacing, you understand the roughness values of certain objects. Mm -hmm. That reads believable. Got um, it. Yeah. Kyle was asking with the swirl, the substance designer curves, is that yeah. something where you draw the Bezier curves or do you just let it do its thing? Yeah, you actually, you are actually able to, I, I did it in a, in my Nomen talk, I go over it a little bit. Mm -hmm. I actually, I, I wasn't able to because I ran out of time, but you can actually see it in his example here, I think, on his gumroad here. You're actually drawing these like you would, like you're moving the beziers and you're able to actually like, there's a, there's some parameters inside the node. You're able to actually curve them and you're able to move them freely as they, you know, as you're creating this object, which is, gives you so much more flexibility than actually having to do this by hand. Oh my. Cause I can't, I can't even imagine what it takes to do this in designer by hand. Like as far as like getting, following the shape and contour and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, well, doing this inside of, inside of ZBrush, you know, or, uh, or Blender or 3D code or any of those yeah, guys, yeah. Too, then you got to deal with clay brush. Yeah. You're essentially, you're essentially having the, my biggest thing is I, I hate being in designer and being almost like, okay, I got to move to a different program. I got to bake out my right. maps. I got, import them in here it's just a convoluted kind of thing where i just want to stay in designer and kind of just focus on that cool all right so if somebody looks like they're uh, you know a candidate you send them an art test right yep I, i'm sure you can't talk about the art test but what kind of things do people do in art tests in your experience just to give a sense because it's like such a black box for a lot of people starting yeah. out so what we end up doing we send them a reference image and we give them the kind of the specs we're looking for. We tell them, okay, this is the kind of poly count you should be hitting and this is the kind of uh, textures and uh, materials that you should be hitting. Yeah. And we don't usually send a concept. We usually gather a few reference images of uh, stuff we like because when you give artists a few reference images, it kind of gives the artist the ability to kind of choose from the uh, those kind of reference images and it gives them the kind of like, okay, what can I choose from these images? Stuff like that. The reason we give them the images rather than the concept is because it shows us the artist like, okay, he can kind of photo bash and kind of create it, its own image from mm -hmm. the images that we've given him. So. Yeah. And then uh, there's also a time limit as well. It's about like two weeks, I would say. Mm -hmm. And those two weeks, you we, we get back the art test and we kind of review from there. Based on the what we're looking for in the art tests gives us a clear idea we should move forward or not with the uh, interview. Great. That makes sense. And when people are, let's say, creating a portfolio, if I'm looking out there, like I'm looking at your art station, there's ground cover and the ground cover is like tiles and maybe there's a tree stump and things like that. Then there's bricks and then it's bricks, but it's also like, hey, this is actually medieval, you know, so they built it not with like polished bricks, but there's like a piece yeah, of yeah. stone in there, a riverbed. And then, of course, the earlier example you were showing us was kind of like a what would we call that it's like you know a, an archway and and you know a really cool trim sheet that's all like medieval architecture correct what are we looking for so you can see early on we want to see early on in my kind of career transitioning to a uh, texture artist yeah we're looking for materials tiling materials as you can see later on into like my later on into my portfolio, yeah. we're starting to get some more blends. We're starting to add more things on top of one another. We're not, this isn't just a single material at this point. We're almost creating like a composition with so many different materials. Right. From yeah, that's a but, great point because it can be like if you're, if I'm looking at this and I'm thinking I got to learn substance, I'm like, holy, where do I yeah. start? Yeah. So I think a great way to start is just creating. Base materials. You want us to do your base metals, your base kind of muds, your base grounds. And then as you kind of progress, you want to start blending these kinds of materials together and seeing what kind of things you uh, 
come up with. The most appealing thing to um, just employers is just being able to see just the base materials because every time you see like a plain just wood planks or plain dirt, yeah, it, it may look like it's not as it's not as appealing as seeing like some crazy like some crazy things you're seeing with the bees or the axe. But what it tells us is that you're able to get the forms correct, you're able to get the roughness values correct, the albedo colors correct. You're, you're able to capture the actual reference of the material in like its kind of most basic form mm-hmm. without that, without having to layer all this other stuff on it to make to it's almost like you're hiding like the base materials from like plain view because you know they're not that good but once you start adding a bunch of stuff they'll look better okay got it that makes a lot of sense start with just the tile ability the repetition the repeatable yeah, quality yeah. you want to get the main forms you want to make sure the roughness breeds well and everything is there a distinction in the job market in terms of like say sci-fi medieval or is it just everything? Well, I feel like when you're making the materials for sci-fi, yeah. you definitely want to stick to like kind of the hard surface stuff. But as far as like every other kind of, um, if you're not working on a sci-fi game, you're definitely going to be making a bunch of kind of organic shapes, a bunch of muds, a bunch of rocks. Right. Whereas more in the sci-fi, you're basically making more metals, more paneling, definitely like shapes and stuff like that. Whereas like, the other things are just kind of more organic. It's almost like it's it, it kind of goes hand in hand with kind of just the same aspect to it is with modeling. Where if you're working on a sci-fi game, you're going to be doing a lot of box modeling, a lot of high polys, a lot of stuff like that. Whereas like mm-hmm. if you're working on like an open world, you know, environment kind of thing, you're doing a lot of sculpting, terrain sculpting, trees, a lot of stuff that will cover the ground area and stuff like that. All right. Yeah. Got a couple more questions about substance and then um, I want to get in and just talk about working in the game industry because you said you're kind of in a you're in an indie game studio is that right yeah 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 so let's so, uh, let's get let me get a couple questions from substance and then we'll jump over to that alex chan any suggestions for achieving more stylized results oh stylized results yeah so funny thing i learned substance designer about two years ago which was mm-hmm. in 2015 i had just left los angeles and i got my job here in san diego working on temple run so Working at an indie studio and a mobile game studio, it gave me a lot more flexibility to start learning programs and kind of mm-hmm. delving into like mm-hmm. different kind of programs, learning kind of like R&D. Yeah. Whereas when I'm working in like a AAA game studio, I mean, we're always on the clock, but more so where time is out of, is, is out of the essence. So basically, I can actually show you. So literally when I learned um, Substance Designer, everything that was I was making in Substance Designer was all stylized. So all these materials that you see on screen right now yes. are actually are actually all stylized. All like this was all done in designer and these were all stylized materials. Did you bring in something from ZBrush? Nope, absolutely oh. not. They did actually at first I was bringing in stuff in from ZBrush. That oh. was kind of my first thing to do, but then slowly I was like, you know what? I think I can make these shapes inside of designer without having to go to ZBrush. And I think I still go back to this kind of um methodology but with stylized materials inside designer it's all about the most basic forms as possible and Mm -hmm. same with the colors as well when you're making your color map in designer for something that's super realistic i tend to gravitate use my gradient node and kind of sample like maybe like 20 different colors Mm -hmm. whereas stylized material i'm grabbing maybe like one or two or three and that's because it's just giving me the the highs and the lows of the texture. And you're letting your kind of height and normal map do the, a lot of the work for you as far as the forms. And same goes with the forms as well. You don't want to over add noise. You don't want to over add like kind of the crazy surfaces that we were talking about earlier. You're sticking to the main kind of shapes and planes and letting the forms really sell the material more than the uh, more than anything else, really. Here's some more like shapes and stuff like that that where I mean that weren't done or that were done in substance designer but yeah all these were pretty stylized and you can see like a lot of it it's almost like you can run your hand over this and it's going to be kind of a flat plane but mm-hmm. a lot of, of what um what sells is the color as well well you know uh, Charlotte had a great question that might be the perfect way for us to segue too so she's saying uh, building a material is a bit like writing code it's easy to learn the basics but knowing how to build something from scratch seems impossible any on yeah. advice on how to just start the building you know i always say this when people just look at 
or students look at graphs, they see the finished product. Yeah. They, they really like see like, <laughs> oh, wow. They see, the, they see the long system of nodes. But once you really, you really want to think of it as smaller graphs, when you really dive into it, and if it's organized neatly, you'll be able to actually dive in and see that this entire thing, it's kind of made up of like 20 small graphs that I just blended or combined together. There's no, it's not, it's, it's almost not this kind of continuation where it starts from A to B. It's almost like you're doing A to B 10 times and kind of combining that to get your final product, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So like here, like this whole B, you might look at this whole thing and be like, whoa, this is insane. But when you're actually, when I clump these together, they're just these small kind of graphs and you're using the, exactly the same nodes and just like kind of almost in my way, in the way I like to think, it's almost I'm working in like a Photoshop method where yeah. I start with like the bottom layer and then I make another kind of like four node graph and I just layer that on top of that. Then once I'm done with that, I make another like four to five node um, little graph and then I add that on top of that and just continue on and, <laughs> and um, sooner you know it, um, your graph is going to be so huge. But like you'll, it's manageable because you realize you're just making these kind of smaller graphs and you're kind of duplicating or even just switching them up a little bit. Okay, so if we were to boil it down, looking at the finished product, it's just you just see complexity. Yeah, um, no, but I feel like anytime I feel like anyone opens a, a really a really complex graph, they get yeah. kind of they they get like it's like daunting just to be like, whoa, this is this is a lot. But yeah, you have to really dive into the nitty gritty of it and try yeah. to find where the artist is making its smaller graphs because got it. a lot of the graph I'm kind of just taking a smaller graph, duplicating, editing it a little bit, and just adding it on top of it again. Great. Got it. All right. So the key thing is, is if you're looking to learn how to start building materials, look at other people's materials, but look for yeah. the graphs within the graph. like the Yeah, yeah exactly. And okay. I think a big thing is just start out small. You know, you don't have to make something crazy complex. Like even just making like basic shape, you can actually save that node. If you make like a cool like shape, a cool noise it, that's made out of five different nodes, mm -hmm. save that to our graph and then plug it into like say you say you do another graph with a different shape, bring in the old graph that you did and just layer on top of it and, and you'll get like different results. You'll get like different kind of shapes and stuff like that. All right. So let's talk about working in the um in the indie game uh, side of things and uh really what i'm wondering here the kind of the tangent or the direction for me is a lot of the people i i deal with are going to be looking for work or they're looking for work now and um everybody thinks uh naughty dog you know last of us or, or yeah, something yeah. like that because you know it's, it's great they got big marketing budgets that's what we're aware of so how do we find these smaller indie game companies or just the smaller game companies or things like that and then what is your thoughts on that job market I would say, I mean, the harsh reality is, all right, this is probably going to be a harsh reality, but I was just like everyone else in college. I was like, I don't want to work for mobile. I don't want to work for indie. I want to mm -hmm. work on something huge. I want to work on something AAA. I want to work on something big. Where, I mean, the harsh reality is not everyone is going to go straight into AAA. I was lucky enough that that happened, but I found myself, once I was working on these AAA games, I'm like, man, this is a lot of work. And sure, at the age I was, because I'm like 26 now, but like 18, 19, I have like, I have the uh, mental capacity to kind of work these crazy amount of crunch hours. Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of people don't understand that AAA games takes a lot of work. You're working on weekends, you're working an insane amount of crunch, which is why I kind of started looking into the mobile and the kind of indie um, realm, because it's a lot more laid back. Your hours are more flexible. Sure, you're not working on like some of the greatest titles ever, but you essentially have like your balance of life and work, which I think is super important to keep. So I think the first indie company I worked for was Redemption and that was for Temple Run. And that was after I had left. This was at, I started Redemption actually after leaving LA and in LA I had shipped Call of Duty and Metal Gear Solid. Mm. And I kind of just wanted to take a break almost because huge the, projects. Huh? Yeah, they were huge projects and the crunch was really getting to me. I was like, this is mentally a lot. <laughs> so I needed to almost take a break and explore other options. But another reason why I kind of 
went more towards the indie route was just the project in general. Before I started on Temple Run, I had actually never done any stylized art before. It was all very realistic. And I found Temple Run being a good like gateway into like, okay, this job, though this this is an indie job, this is going to give me the kind of the ability to learn how to do stylized textures, stylized modeling, which will in turn give me, it makes me more like, by an employer, you're like, okay, this guy can do both realism and stylized. So mm. he's a good to have kind of thing. So I think working at an indie studio is a great way just to like get your foot in the door, really. Even if you're doing internships and stuff like that. How are we finding those jobs? Is it just Indeed? Is it ArtStation? Is it... Honestly, it took me... A lot of these jobs aren't posted online. You, mm-hmm. really, have to, you really have to dig and search... When I was in college and I was ready to look for a job, I basically went on this website, which essentially you can click on a a little state and it'll tell you all the companies that are there. Mm -hmm. I basically went down from like San Diego all the way up to Seattle. I was, I just clicked on every single one of these studios and sent a resume, whether they were hiring or not. The next day I had like 20 new emails in my inbox. Uh, saying like we're not hiring or we love your stuff we're just not currently looking or even that's actually how i landed my job at zindigi games when i first got out to um, los angeles was there actually was an environment artist position there was not an environment artist position but i sent my resume anyways and they loved it and they i went down there for an interview and another big like kind of thing that i learned by applying is and i learned this early on even if you're a student, even if, if you're like a junior environment artist, apply for the senior environment artist position, even though there's not one listed on the website. Obviously, if there is one listed on the website, definitely apply for that one. But sometimes I was applying to senior environment artist positions as a junior and they were still emailing me back saying like, oh, we we love your stuff. We'd be we, we want to see if you'd be interested in a junior position. Hmm. So that's like that, that's another way where I was finding jobs super quickly <laughs> that's great i love that idea of just reaching right out when you're reaching right out are you just like is there a contact there where you just sending in a resume via email or a lot of the times it was just through their, their portal their website portal where it's like apply um you know send your resume which a lot of the time it's unfortunately you're not going to hear anything back but once you do hear back you have their email they're emailing right. their like work email and honestly i keep every single one of my recruiters emails in my inbox. I have like 20 recruiters emails in my inbox, just almost collecting over the years because I've talked to so many different ones. And it's a nice way to kind of open up the conversation again. Like, hey, it's been a few years. How you doing? You know, just always keeping up with the recruiters. Are you guys looking? What are you guys working on? Stuff like that. And another great way is if you really want to reach out HR instead of having to go through the whole um, portal is I would highly suggest Going on LinkedIn, searching the studio you want and just searching HR and sending them a kind of LinkedIn messaging message there. Because I've noticed a lot of recruiters on LinkedIn, they usually say like, oh, send me a LinkedIn message if you're interested or here's my work email, which aren't publicly anywhere else but LinkedIn, which is kind of strange. <laughs> huh. Yeah, that is. A couple of days ago, you know, I just was on LinkedIn and I noticed that a lot of the recruiters actually put their work email in their contact info. Mm. So instead of Instead of having to go through the whole portal of like up, upload your resume and see if you get a response back, you can actually just try to send your resume directly to the HR person. So got it. That sounds great. And in fact, that was um I think Adam's here with us, and he was talking about that the other day. He just applied for a job, wasn't sure he was going to get it, and next thing you know, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, you got the job. So you did the um the hardcore. You did AAA first. Yeah, I did AAA first. So the way I kind of got started in the industry as yeah. a, the way I started was I went to the R Institute from 2009 to 2012, right after high school. In 2012, I was a senior AI. So one of our classes and one of our required classes was a class called Intro. We are lucky that our school had a really great connection with Sony Online Entertainment, mm-hmm. which now you guys know it as Daybreak Games. Okay. So that's the way we were getting internships because we had, they were both, this, the studio was like maybe 15 minutes away from the school. So every quarter they would get a pair of new interns. So I started out as an intern there for a class, right? 
And um, after the internship, I just kind of went on a whim to my art director. I was like, hey, are you are you guys hiring? Are you guys looking for anything? And lucky enough, he actually I actually got hired on as a contract uh, environment artist while I was still going to school. I actually was able to ship my first title before I even graduated school. Oh, man. So by, yeah. By the time I got my diploma, I had already had one ship title under my belt, which was uh, <laughs> really nice. But at the same time, there's also kind of these downfalls with that. Where during this whole, like I was working and going to school at the same time, my grades started slipping. My projects weren't coming out as great as they could have been. I was kind of jealous of all like my other, like all my other classmates who were coming out with these awesome senior projects. And I'm like, I'm barely like, str- I'm struggling to get these projects done because we were crunching to get the first, <laughs> my first game out. So I was like, is this really worth it? Is this like is having a, <laughs> having a ship title better than having all these great portfolio projects that mm-hmm. I'll be soon trying to apply to different companies with. Yeah. yeah. In the end it worked out, but um, I would definitely tell a student like focus on your work as much as possible. Obviously if you get a job in the industry, I know a lot of people like, Oh, I have a job already. I'm just going to quit school. Like, no, just finish school and uh, just, fo- just try to do your best. <laughs> do you have any examples of your schoolwork still in your art station? Uh, Man, I don't think so. Let me look. Uh, I try to hide that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I, I try okay. to hide last year's stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. So this right here, this one was actually pretty popular on Polycount for a bit. It was called El Rancho. And this was actually my senior kind of thesis. Mm-hmm. This was all done in UDK yeah. uh, back in the day. And it was essentially an advanced game modeling and lighting class. Uh, class and this yeah. was essentially one of my uh, portfolio pieces like when i graduated it was done by me and one other uh, artist who he works at respawn <laughs> now great yeah but um this was kind of the quality like i was doing like when i was graduating this was pre-pbr so all we were using gloss and spec maps yep. and like looking back at it th- at this now it's just it's so hard to look at <laughs> 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 because like, i see so many errors so many things wrong with it but yeah. Why I keep this on here is just because, sure, the assets themselves aren't that great to look at on their own. But what this piece gets its point across is composition, composition, mood, and lighting. And I feel like employers really want to see that. Mm. That's great. That's a really good question to ask or to to address. Anyways, is is it important to have everything at a high high finish level, or because an environment? any environment there's so much to do you have to you have to have trade-offs yeah yeah definitely i mean you can cheat your way through an environment as long as you get the the sense of lighting the mood it really can capture and do so much for you even these like grand scheme crazy environments that you see in like even in games sure you can like take you can walk up to like the most smallest little prop and you'll notice it's not done that great but when it's next to this grand like open world environment it's just like so minuscule that the player won't even notice they're mostly focusing on the grand scheme of things the whole overall picture but i had that problem when i was actually graduating where as employers were looking at me as a prop artist because all i had in my portfolio were props Mm -hmm. so um, i've told this to students many times who are trying to look for environment art positions is that you definitely want to do a bunch of scenes don't just do like small little props even if you take your small little prop, try to make it like a hero asset. Try to make it like a kind of a, a bigger prop and then kind of just fake, start fading, like bringing in smaller pieces, fading it in. And then eventually you'll have like kind of a full environment. You just basically start out with a centerpiece and kind of just start populating around and eventually you'll have like an environment. Okay, cool. That's good to hear. All right. And uh, Patrick's got a question here. I think that's pretty relevant. And is this, uh, Patrick, you're in the, uh, the boot camp coming up, yeah? Do recruiters require a school degree? You know, how does that factor into the whole conversation for you? You know, it varies, honestly. I know HR puts it in there, but I know HR puts stuff in there just to kind of screw with yeah. people, you know, so not everybody applies. It varies from studio to studio. In my first studio, my art director, he's like, oh, he doesn't have a degree? Okay, let me see his portfolio. Mm-hmm. It all boils down to the portfolio. I have a I have a lot over the like seven years working in this industry. I've had a lot of colleagues who have had are self taught. They've had no like education, no um, degree or anything of that totally. nature, and it's it's their portfolio that 
your portfolio is your degree. Like that's what speaks to you. But at the same time, I actually had a few, I had one studio ask me what my SAT scores were oh, wow. and what my GPA was, which was yeah. kind of off. <laughs> you, do, you, do you have an SAT score? Because I don't. I do. I completely bombed it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know I needed I, I actually did not even have to take the SATs to get into art school, which yeah. would have <laughs> saved me a couple bucks. Yeah. But I would say definitely not, not as much as I feel like they used to. I feel like nowadays, um, a degree, it just, it, it's, it's not even on their radar anymore mm. because sure the HR wants to see it, but if I'm sure the art director does not care, he cares more about the art side of it. Right. I think he, he's under HR, pressure. Yeah. Yeah. The HR is definitely the one who's kind of more concerned about the paperwork and all that stuff. But in the end, it's the art director who's going to look at your portfolio and it's going to, he's the one who's going to speak whether you get hired or not. All right, so let's check out your um, art station and put it right there. And Jonathan, good to see you here, Jonathan. How's the job going? Jonathan uh, Mercado is uh, giving a big shout out to the Art Institute. <laughs> cool. <laughs> All right, so right now your job's material surfacer. Is uh, this a, is this a yeah, job I, people can get right from go or do they need to start as props? Do they need to work their way up? Is this... That, oh, uh, nowadays... Like texture artist is actually now like a, a job listing on most like studios now. Yeah. Before I feel like um, the way the industry is currently moving, I, I realized about around like maybe 2015 around that time is I noticed the the kind of industry shifting because these games were be getting bigger and more games were producing like open world titles. Mm -hmm. You're kind of this, a studio now is kind of broken up into these teams where you're either a prop artist, a world builder, or a texture artist. Got it. And that, that's definitely in like, it's definitely uh, in trip, mostly in AAA. Whereas in indie, you're kind of wearing a bunch of hats because the teams are so small. Mm -hmm. You're you're able to like touch a little bit of everything. But yeah, so texture artist is definitely something that you can that, that's something you can apply for, and that's something you can stick to. I would definitely say stick to your strengths. I know when you're in um, in college, you want to like, you're doing all these environments, you're doing like all, all this, you're doing so much of everything. I think once you kind of land your first job, you'll eventually kind of start gravitating towards what you like to do. You'll start kind of gravitating. All right, do you, do you feel more comfortable world building? Do you feel like, are you, are you more um, skilled in texture uh, creation? And mm -hmm. I've, feel like in like past interviews I've had, that's the question that keeps coming up is like, what do you think is like your strengths? What do you like doing textures more than world? Do you like doing textures more than props, props more than world? Right. Yeah. Got it. Another question for you here from Daniel. Daniel went to school for mechanical engineering. Then he, uh, he came into a character course here at GAI. Does, um, do other degrees other things factor into your decisions you know would it help him having an engineering background is that worth mentioning or is it just um, work? yeah i mean i actually i think so i think your other degrees help you a little bit more in as far as in an indie environment like in a smaller studio scale because they'll see like okay this guy can probably do some coding or some engineering like right an asset in case something comes up and we need we're like need of a hand we could probably pull him off from the art for a little bit and put him on engineer. Whereas I feel like in a big studio of like 300 people, it's so like, you know, you're, you're kind of so set to your, your work that may, I would probably not mention it in like a, a bigger company unless mm -hmm. you're actually applying for it. Yeah. It's nice to know that. I mean, it's nice to tell your, the employer that you have that, but I think it gives you a little bit more points with a smaller team environment, I think. Okay. All right. So you have been in AAA. You've gone to Indie. You've been overworked. You've done the hours. You know, yeah. what do you say to people who are looking to do this as a job and, and they're like, I, this is all I want to do. And you're like, I've done this. And, you know, there's pros and there's cons. <laughs> I mean, I love it. I can't tell you enough. You want to join the game industry? Uh, I'm 100% backing you. I'll do everything it takes to get, your, <laughs> to get, to get you a job in the industry, no matter what. There's definitely some dark days. I've been through layoffs. I've been through uh, games being canceled. But in the end, like you're making games for a living. That was the one thing when I was in college. I was like, I don't want to be stuck in a suit and like a cubicle for like the rest of my life. I want to make art. 
and art, art in its own can, it's definitely has its ups and downs. It has its struggles, but in the end, it's probably one of the coolest jobs you'll ever have. It's just creating art for a living. Is there like one project or test exercise you can recommend people to really dive into substance? Is that like go in and create dirt or is there any tips you can give if somebody just wants to, wants some guidance for that first step? I honestly would just open it and yeah. just look at the different nodes. Just really look at like what they're capable of doing. That's definitely the, the one thing that I learned early on is you're not going to be able to use these nodes if you don't actually know what they're doing. Yeah. So well, even though you're not connecting them, even though you're not kind of plugging them in anywhere, it's just like actually like drag them into your, your layout and kind of see what, what are, what are my options with this kind of node? What, what kind of, what kind of things can I do with this? The other thing I would suggest for people just trying to learn substance is download artist graphs who are like, who have them on sale on Gumroad or ArtStation mm -hmm. and just open those up and just look at like kind of like I was describing earlier on the smaller kind of graphs that they started out with. Yeah. Just to see how they're getting their smaller forms and kind of just start off with that before diving into like these bigger projects. Man, that sounds awesome. That sounds like a great place for us to wrap this up as well. Javier, man, thank you so much for coming in and sharing yeah. your particular genius here. At the yeah, this was a lot of fun. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I love looking at your art station and, and that recent work. I don't know anybody that's pushing substance why there's like it's just a handful of people out there pushing substance like you but it's so cool Thank to see that model that was awesome yeah i mean um i'm still a little plug i've been working on something on, yeah. um, on twitch you know i, I stream kind of yeah, where day. do we find you twitch.tv slash mesh modeler so you can follow me there i'm i think a, a few of your students are watch me every night cool. um but i actually have quite a there's like collection of small videos from like the last couple of days yeah, I've just been working on this kind of new rubble um, texture that I'm working on. Yeah. All but right. Besides that, hit me up on email, and I'm really good at responding with emails. If any student really wants to like ask me a question or anything, um, follow me. Any th my handle is Meshmaller, so any social media that you know of, I'm probably on there. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much, Javier. Yeah, yeah. It's been great talking to you. All right. So I want to thank you so much for being here, for taking the time and for listening to this podcast. And I want to ask a couple of things from you. Number one, make sure you leave a comment or you rate this on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever it is that you're getting this. That's going to make a big difference in helping us get the word out and get people to know who we are. All right. The other thing is I want to make sure you know where to find us. So you can head over to www.gameartinstitute.com where you can learn about our flagship program, which is the Game Artist Boot Camp. This, this is designed for those who are really looking to move the needle on their career and really lock in that job. You may have gone to school and learned a bunch, maybe haven't learned a bunch. But at the Game Art Institute, the primary focus we have is the very specific industry skills, the triggers that you really need to hit in that job interview. What are the specific things that they're looking for? That's what we're going to be training you on. We're taking applications right now for environment artists and for character artists. So make sure you head over to www.gameartinstitute.com and apply today. That way we can have that conversation, make sure this is a fit for you, make sure that you're a fit for it. And if everything is perfect, then we will sign you up for that right away and get you into your training and start moving the needle on your career. All right, thank you so much again for being here. Take care, have an amazing day.